Tonight's presentation is titled Unbelievable Compressions. And our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's uh, numerous for uh, he's an author for numerous aviation publications. He's a certified flight instructor, uh, A&P mechanic with IA, uh, 2008 Aviation Maintenance Technician uh, of the Year for the FAA, and uh, a member of EAA. Mike, thanks so much uh, for being with us tonight, and I turn it over to you. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I am uh, finally recovered from Air Venture. It was actually a, it was actually a great a, a great air venture. Uh, the weather pretty much cooperated, and uh, uh, I did eleven presentations and had some really interesting get-togethers with a lot of wonderful aviators. So, and then I came home and soaked my head in a bucket for a couple of days, and <laughs> now I'm I'm back to normal. Um, so the uh, tonight's presentation is on a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is uh, compression tests. Um, you know, if you're an aircraft owner, um, every year you put your airplane in for an annual inspection, uh, and then there's this moment of terror uh, when your IA pulls your top spark plugs and uh, takes a compression reading on each of the cylinders. You know, hopefully does it immediately after you deliver the airplane when everything's still warm. <clears throat> and you hold your breath and wait for the numbers to come back. And if the numbers look good, then, then, then everything's fine. And if the numbers look bad, then you brace yourself for, uh, for a bunch of work and uh, a big invoice. Um, and um, you, you brace yourself not only for the fact that you, that you're going to have to have a cylinder removed and either reworked or or replaced, but anytime you have a cylinder removed, that kind of opens Pandora's box because it puts a big hole in the side of your engine, and your eye is going to stick his head in there and look around. And if he doesn't like what he sees, then things could get really, really expensive. Um, so this is kind of an ordeal that, or a ritual that, that aircraft owners go through every year, and um, we sort of want to change it. I mean, the typical dialogue is the uh, mechanic says, uh, well, we did the compression test and two of your cylinders were below 60 over 80 this year, so we're going to have to replace them. And since we're dropping the in induction and exhaust and pulling all these baffles off and everything, you know, while it's all apart, you might, might want to just go ahead and let us replace all, all four of the cylinders or all six of the cylinders, however many you have. And a lot of owners wind up um, essentially getting talked into a top overall on the basis that, you know, if a couple of cylinders are weak, then the rest of them are probably not far behind and it's just a lot more cost efficient to change them all at once. At any rate, this is a, uh, um, a a major ouch to the pocketbook, and it, it also is frequently something that uh, it shouldn't be done. Just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about, anytime you replace a cylinder, nowadays new cylinders typically go for about two or three thousand dollars, depending on what kind of engine it is, what the displacement is, and so on. Um, if you can send your cylinder out for repair, uh, then the cost is maybe half that much. Um, but anytime you send your cylinder out for repair, there, there's always a risk that, that it will be deemed unrepairable. I, I just earlier today talked with a Seneca owner who replaced quite a large number of cylinders on his, uh, on his twin. And every, every time he sent a cylinder into the cylinder shop, they called him up and said, "Oh, this thing has unrepairable cracks. We're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to repair it." I suggested maybe he he might want to pick a different cylinder shop, <laughs> but uh, um, but at any rate, th there's no guarantee that that the cylinders can be repaired, and 
a lot of cylinder uh, shops are kind of zero tolerance outfits. And then of course there's there's the cost of the labor to remove and replace the cylinder and depending on what airplane it is and how good the access is and whether it's turbocharged or not, how complicated the exhaust is to remove um, and how many cylinders on which side of the engine are being removed. You, you can figure somewhere between four and eight man hours per cylinder. So depending on your shop rate and so on, you, you could be talking 300 to a thousand dollars in labor per cylinder on top of the, the, the cost of, of, of either repairing or replacing the cylinder. So each, each cylinder could wind up costing somewhere between a thousand and four thousand dollars a piece. And if you're if you wind up going for the argument that, that you really ought to replace them all, which happens an awful lot in my experience. Um, you could be first four cylinder engine be out 10 grand or, or a six cylinder engine be more like $15,000. So this is a lot of money. So first of all, let's talk about whether, whether this cylinder replacement is really required because, you know, in my experience, the mechanics do a compression check and tell the owner, you know, we've got some weak cylinders, we have to replace them. So let's talk about whether we really have to. Um, first of all, we're, we're, let's start with where the requirement is for doing the compression test to begin with, because by the time we're done today, I'm going to try to convince you that the compression numbers that your mechanic takes aren't worth the paper that he writes them on. But um, Appendix D of Part 43, Part 43 is the part of the FARs that deals with maintenance, and Appendix D which is called scope and detail of items to be included in an annual and 100 hour inspections. Uh, so it's kind of the regulatory minimum checklist of, of, of what is required to be done uh, at, at every annual. And if you have to do 100 hours, every 100 hours as well. And, and the, the relevant part of Appendix D says, each person performing an annual or 100 hour inspection shall inspect where applicable internal engine for cylinder compression and for metal particles or foreign matter on screens and sump drain plugs. This reg was written a long time ago. Most of us have, have oil filters now rather than screens, but they didn't update the reg, but, but we all know what they mean. So you're supposed to check the en if the engine's making metal, which is perfectly reasonable. And the reg actually says that you're required to check cylinder compression. So that's where the, the regulatory requirement is for, for doing the compression test. So the mechanic really is obligated uh, if he's doing an annual inspection to, to do a compression test. Now, the next question is, so what's he supposed to do with the results? Well, Appendix D goes on to say, if there is weak cylinder compression, then, then he's supposed to further inspect for improper internal condition and improper internal tolerances. And that's all it says. So how weak is weak? Well, the, the reg doesn't say how weak is weak. It, it just says weak compression. So that kind of leaves the question of whether compression is is too weak to be acceptable in, in the eye of the beholder. So, so where did this 60 over 80 threshold that everybody seems to have bought into come from? Um, that that compression less than 60 over 80 is 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 not acceptable. Well, that actually came from the FAA too, but not in a regulation. It, it, it it's in an advisory circular. It's in a big giant advisory circular, uh, AC 43. Um, 13-1B, acceptable methods, techniques, and practices for aircraft inspection, repair, and all, um, alterations. This is a advisory circular the size of a pretty good-sized telephone directory, <laughs> and, and it's sort of the mechanics bible. Um, and AC, so, but, so it is an advisory circular, and it, it, 
it's not a regulation. Um, so so it, it provides um, things that the FAA considers acceptable, but not the not the only way of doing things. But anyway, rate, let's look at what AC 4313-1B says, because it has some interesting stuff in it. But it says in, in pertinent part here, if a cylinder has less than a 60 over 80 reading on a differential um, differential differential test gauges on a hot engine, keep that in mind, on a hot engine. And procedures in paragraphs uh, 814B5 I and J, well, I'll show you what those are in a minute, fail to raise the compression reading, presumably above 60 over 80, then the cylinder must be removed and inspected. So th this this is where the notion uh, that if, if a cylinder measures less than 60 over 80, it must be removed, comes from. Now, first of all, let's, let's look at what those, those two paragraphs that it references are, so the, 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 or things you're supposed to do to raise the compression. The, the first one, which was little sub paragraph I says, um, that if you don't like, if you, if you get a, 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 threat, a compression below 60 over 80, you're supposed to run the engine for at least three minutes and recheck the compression. And that, that's because compression readings are always better when the cylinder is hot than when it's not. And unfortunately in the real world, even though AC 43 says that it's 60 over 80 on a hot engine, um, unfortunately, in the real world, we, we don't often do these compression tests as hot as we should. And, you know, frequently the, the airplane comes in and, 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 it, and it's a matter of hours or maybe even a days before the technician gets around to uncowling it and doing the compression test. So we often see compression tests being done cold. Um, but even if the even even if the mechanic makes his uses his best efforts to do a hot compression check, I mean I fly a, I fly a piston twin with two six cylinder Continental engines, and normally I take the airplane up, uh, fly it around the pattern a couple of times, get everything nice and hot, um, stick it in my hangar just as quick as I can, pop the top cowls off as quick as I can, and start taking out top spark plugs and doing compression tests. But I've got 12 cylinders on two different engines. And, you know, by the time I get to the last cylinder, it's not very hot anymore, no matter how fast I work. So it, it, it's it's hard to do that. So so this says, you know, if, if, if you get a compression that's problematic, you're supposed to run the engine and heat up the cylinder and then, and then recheck the compression. And if you do that, you know, in my experience, the compression is going to come up 10 points or, or more, sometimes a lot more. The second thing it says you're supposed to do is, and this would really be applicable if, if the leakage is past the, uh, past the valves, usually the exhaust valve, is to try to stake the valve uh, by pressurizing the cylinder and taking off the rocker cover and, and using a mallet and a fiber drift to joggle the exhaust valve while it's under pressure and try to get it to seat better. Sometimes this has a dramatic effect on raising compression, sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, the, so the advisory circular says you're supposed to do the compression hot. If you don't get a good, if you get a reading under 60 over 80, you're supposed to run the engine and try it again. And if it's a leakage past the exhaust valve, you're supposed to take off the rocker cover and try to stake the valves or you know, juggle the valve with a mallet and a fiber drift to try to get that compression to come up over 60 over 80. Um, but if you do all those things and still under 60 over 80, the advisory circular says you have to remove the cylinder. However, if you fly behind a Lycoming engine or a Continental engine, 
this this advisory circular doesn't even apply to you. Why? Because the advisory circular right in its cover page says this advisory circular contains methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator only when there are no manufacturer repair or maintenance instructions. So AC 4313-1B is a set of default procedures that are only to be used in cases where the manufacturer doesn't give you a procedure. But if the manufacturer gives you a procedure, then the manufacturer's procedure always takes precedence. And it turns out that both Continental and Lycoming do provide guidance on compression tests. So the guidance from AC 4313-1B that we just went through, which is kind of interesting, doesn't really apply to Continentals and Lycoming. You know, maybe maybe it applies to Jabberoos or something, but it doesn't apply to Lycomings or Continentals because they provide manufacturer's guidance and that takes precedence over the FAA's advisory circular. So let's see what that guidance is. Well, Continental's guidance, which used to appear in a service bulletin, SB03-3, and now appears in Continental's manual M0, which is their standard practices manual. Um, I'll sort of, sort of summarize what it says, but it, 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 it first of all, says, well, a 60 over a, a no-go threshold does not apply to continental engines. The, the no-go threshold, they don't actually give you a number, but they, they say that you have to calibrate the gauge with a master orifice tool. And that master orifice tool represents the maximum acceptable leak. So you take your gauges and, and, and you hook them to the master orifice tool and you take what's essentially a compression measurement on that. And whatever number you get, that's the no-go threshold. Um, nowadays, most compression testers have the master orifice built right into the gauge. So you just turn a valve and the gauge measures the master orifice and then you turn the valve the other way and it, it measures the cylinder. But at any rate, the, the threshold is based on a master orifice and for almost all compression test gauge sets, that number winds up being somewhere in the low 40s. I've seen it as low as 40, I've seen it as high as 45, but somewhere in the low 40s is normally where that no-go threshold comes up. So Continental says that, that compressions can be as low as somewhere in the low 40s before you reach the no-go threshold. But M0 also says anytime you do a compression test, you have to also do a bore scope inspection of the cylinder. And if the compression is below this no-go threshold of somewhere in the 40s, and you do a bore scope inspection of the cylinder and you don't see any obvious reason for the low compression, like a burnt exhaust valve or scored cylinder walls or something, then you're supposed to go fly the airplane and retest it. And unlike the, unlike the advisory circular, which says run the engine for three minutes, Continental says, fly the airplane for at least 45 minutes. It doesn't actually give a maximum, but it says fly for at least 45 minutes and then retest the, the cylinder that flunked hot. And when we do this, we always see a dramatic increase in, in the compression numbers. Like I said, almost always at least 10 points. And the the... the the most notable case of this that I've run into happened several years ago with a Cirrus client of ours who put his SR22 in a shop in Florida for an annual inspection. And one of the cylinders tested 38 over 80, which was below the master orifice threshold. And the shop said, we have to pull the cylinder. And we said, well, not so fast. Let's follow the guidance from Continental. So we had them dust off their bore scope and take a bunch of bore scope images and we all agreed we couldn't see anything wrong with that cylinder but it was measuring 38 over 80. 
So we said, okay, well, Continental says, go fly the airplane for at least 45 minutes and retest it hot. And the IA says, well, how are we going to do that? The, you know, I, I'm not allowed to fly the airplane unless I sign off the annual, and I'm not going to sign off the annual with a compression of 38 over 80. And we said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> and he said, well, on what basis could I possibly sign off an annual with a compression of 38 over 80? And I said, on the basis of what it says in manual M0, which is that, you, that, that the fact that it has low compression doesn't mean that it's unairworthy. If it looks okay under the bore scope, you have to give it the benefit of the doubt. So we convinced him to sign off the annual with, a, with an IOU that the customer would come back within an hour and, and he was going to be standing there ready with his spark plug wrench and his, his uh, spark plug socket and his compressor and his um, test set. And he was going to test that cylinder hot when it came in. So the, the customer went out and flew the airplane for an hour, brought it back. He quickly uncalled it and tested that cylinder. And the 38 over 80 cylinder measured 72 over 80 on the retest. Um, doesn't usually go up quite that much, but it just gives you an idea of why this is really, really, really good guidance that we don't want to be pulling cylinders that look good under the bore scope just because they have low compression. Um, here's, a, here's a compression tester and, and the yellow arrow is pointing at this little um, a valve that is marked master orifice. And most of the compression testers we use nowadays have the master orifice built in, and we're supposed to calibrate the gauge every time we do a compression test right before, and we're supposed to write the master orifice reading in the logbook entry right next to the compression readings, because otherwise the compression readings really have no particular meaning, because the master orifice is what defines what the minimum acceptable threshold is. So at any rate, that's what Continental has to say. And, and I really like Continental's guidance and, and we always try to hold the shops we work with to, to follow that guidance to the letter because it's it's very enlightened thing. Lycoming's guidance is, is quite different. Um, and it appears in the Lycoming Service Instruction 1191A. And, and, and Lycoming still adheres to the old 60 over 80 standard. But what they say in the service instruction is, if the pressure reading is below 60 PSI, meaning 60 over 80, removal and overhaul of the cylinders should be considered. That's interesting wording. Doesn't say it's required the way AC 4313 did. It said should be considered. And this gives your IA a lot of wiggle room. If you have a Lycoming with low compression, um, he doesn't have to remove the cylinder. Um, now, not a lot of IAs have the courage to, to take that wiggle room, but it's important to understand that Lycoming does not require cylinder removal if the compression is less than 60 over 80. All they require is that it be considered. <laughs> So let's 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 talk a little bit about this compression test and, and why I'm not exactly a huge fan of compression testing. Um, there, I wrote an article in the July um, 2023 20, uh, issue just a, a couple months ago um, called "Unbelievable Compression" uh, on this subject, and. Um, it was triggered by a, an email that I got from from the owner of a of a, a Piper a PA12 cruiser or super cruiser, which is actually the I guess it was the successor to the J5 Cub, kind of a cute, cool airplanes, powered by a Lycoming O235. And this owner who who emailed me had owned this airplane for quite a long time, and he had it maintained at the same shop by the same mechanic for uh, quite a long time. And he meticulously recorded all of the compression readings um, that, that were taken on this engine over this period. It was a 13 year history that he sent me. 
of compression readings on, on this O235 engine, it's four, four cylinder, small four cylinder Lycoming engine. Um, and he explained to me that these were all, these compression readings were all done in the same shop by the same mechanic. And that during this 13 year period, no cylinder work had been performed on the airplane. No cylinders had been removed or re reworked or, or anything. And if, if you look at these numbers, um, they're kind of all over the map. It's a little hard to see in the table here, so I graphed them out. <laughs> so th this is the compression history, 13-year uh, compression history of, of, of this uh, Lycoming O235 in the, in the Piper Supercruiser. Um, oh, I, I, that's right. Actually, the 13th year, the very right-hand numbers were done in a different shop, but the first 12 were all done by the same mechanic in the same shop. So there shouldn't have been any variation in terms of mechanic technique and that sort of thing. But you can see that the, the there, there are no clear trends here. <laughs> I mean, somehow or other owners get this idea that that they expect to see um, incremental clear trends in compression and they start out good. And then over time as the cylinders wear that they gradually get worse and worse. And th that's that's not what happens. And th this this 12 or 13 year history here makes it pretty clear that that's not what happens. Uh, the, the, the most interesting cylinder of these four cylinders was cylinder number one. So I graphed that out separately. And th this is the compression history of cylinder number one. So it, it went from 75, the next year it's down to 64, then it popped back up to 78, <laughs> is almost perfect. Then the next year it went down to 53, I asked him, well, how how come the cylinder wasn't removed when it measured 53? And he said, well, I don't remember, but apparently his IA was one of those rare birds who who, who did use his wiggle room to, to not pull the cylinder, or maybe he retested it and didn't record it or something, I don't know. But then it went up to 70 and then went it down to, to, to um, 60. And, and it went up to 78. It's just all over the place. You know, and it seems very unlikely that the cylinder would get, you know, profoundly ill and then cure itself and then get sick again and then cure itself. That, that just doesn't seem like a plausible explanation here. And, and to demonstrate that this is not exactly a, a, an outlier, um, there was a, a 600 hour endurance test that Continental performed uh, it, down in its uh, factory in Mobile on a TSI 0520 UB engine. Um, trying to remember, I think that may be the banana, the, 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 the uh, A36TC engine or something like that. Um, but at any rate, they, to, to certify an engine, the FAA requires 600 hour endurance tests where they run the heck out of the engine in a test stand. And they run it essentially continuously for 600 hours and they shut it down every 50 hours, change the oil, um, inspect the filter, do a compression check, fire the engine back up, run another 50 hours. And they, they keep doing this until they have 600 hours on the engine. It's a, it's a torture test that they do in their test cell. So they 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 do, do do check the compression every time they shut down the engine for an oil change and um, in in during this test this is this is the trajectory of the cylinder number two differential compression readings again this was done by Continental in in, in their engineering test cell and again you can see that the compression is is all over the place it it you know it starts out um about 71 and it works its way down to 56 and then it pops back up and it you know after 450 hours it's 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 up to 73 and then it starts going down again um and, and again it's it, it's not plausible to think that this cylinder you know got ill and then got well all, all on its own um that, that just that that can't possibly be the explanation. So so what's going on with these compression readings? That they they certainly don't have the kind of trajectory that 
most people expect that they would have. And it just turns out that this is a terrible test. Um, there's more noise than signal. The, the test is not reliable, meaning the results are not repeatable. You know, perfect example is this cylinder that tested 38 over 80 and, and an hour later tested 72 over 80. And it's not valid. The, the compression the number isn't doesn't correlate well with the actual health of the cylinder. Um, it, it's just a terrible test. And it's been with us, you know, like pretty much forever. And it's been with us since back in the days where, where we didn't have anything better because we didn't have horoscopes and stuff like we do now. But it's a horrible test. And it, there, there are just all sorts of artifacts that affect the test. Uh, let me just discuss one of those with you. There are, there are a whole bunch of things about the test that cause it to, to be not reliable and not valid, but, but here's one of them. Um, when an engine is actually running and its cylinders and pistons and everything are up to normal operating temperature, the piston has a very tight fit in, in the cylinder. And the compression rings don't have to make up much of a gap. The, 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 the piston fits very snugly in the cylinder and there's very little opportunity for gas to leak, leak past the rings. But we can't do a compression test on a cylinder that's at operating temperature. By the time we get to, to do a compression test, the cylinder is a whole lot cooler than normal operating temperature. Um, sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's cold, but it's never really hot. We just, you just there's no way to, to, to test the cylinder anywhere near, you know, a, a cylinder head temperature of 380 or 400 degrees, which is what it is when the engine is actually running. So because the piston is aluminum, and the cylinder barrel is steel, and aluminum has twice the expansion coefficient of steel. Um, the piston is is made so that it is considerably smaller in diameter than the cylinder barrel at room temperature. But as everything heats up, the the, the piston expands, as I say, twice as fast as the steel barrel expands, to where it has a nice snug fit at 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 normal operating temperatures. So we're not testing it at normal operating temperatures. We're testing much cooler. And the, so the piston has a really sloppy fit in the cylinder when we're doing the compression test. And the compression rings have to make up the difference. Um, and the compression rings um, have a gap in them. And the piston, when we bring it up to top dead center, when we're doing a compression test, doesn't come up to top dead center nice and straight. It comes up crooked because the connecting rod is is pushing it sideways as we are rotating the propeller to bring the piston up to top dead center. So we got a piston that has a sloppy fit in the cylinder and it's and it's crooked. It's not centered in the cylinder bore. And we've got compression rings that are trying to make up the gap. And depending on exactly where the piston winds up and depending on exactly where the gap happens to be, which is pretty much random because the, the, the compression rings um, migrate around when the engine is running. So it's unpredictable exactly where that gap is gonna be when we do the compression test. Um, but you know, depending on how the, this all comes out, we either have a, a tiny little gap, like like is on the right side, that very little air can pass through, or we have a big giant gap, like the one on the left side, where a whole lot of air can go through. Now, th this is not exactly drawn to scale, but I, I exaggerated a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. But so that there's there's a you, you can have just dramatic differences in. In in, uh, in the compression reading, in terms of how much air is 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 getting past the rings, 
um, de depending on, like I say, wh wh where the piston winds up and, and where the gap winds up relative to the piston. Um, there was an old Continental Service Bulletin, which didn't survive the transition to M0, but it suggested that when you do a compression test, if you don't like the number that comes up, try, try rotating the, the propeller to top dead center in the opposite direction, which will put the opposite side load on the piston and see if you get a better number. And whichever number is better, that's the one you should use, <laughs> which is actually not a bad suggestion, but I've very seldom seen that mechanics actually do it. And it's kind of dropped out of the literature that this was an old service bulletin that was the predecessor, I think, of SB03-3. Um, now you can also see fr from this why it's so important to do compression tests as hot as possible. You're never going to have a piston that fits really snugly in the cylinder when you do the compression test, like it is when the engine's running. But the snugger the fit, the 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 more likely it is that you're not going to have this artifact of the test that I'm illustrating in this picture. So we we really need to try to do these tests as hot as we possibly can. But as hot as we possibly can is still not terribly hot. And the first cylinder we test is always going to be hotter than the last cylinder we test. It's just a fact of life, and and it, and the, the temperature uh, profoundly affects the results, as does this random position of the ring gap and and the piston. Um, I, I I was kidding my colleague Paul New the other day. I said if if you, if you ever take your compression tester apart you'll find a little tiny pair of dice in there, which isn't actually true, but there's a huge amount of randomness to these compression readings. And you could see that on the on the two graphs that I showed you, that compressions go high, compressions go low, and they don't. it doesn't represent any difference in the cylinder condition. It just represents the random elements of, of this very terrible test. So we really shouldn't be relying on on compression tests as the be all and end all of cylinder health. We, we we have to do them. We're forced to do them. They're written into the regs. The regs are, you know, very old and not likely to change. So so we're required to do the test, but we're not really required to pay that much attention to them, to the test results. We really should be using the bore scope, which is an infinitely better way of assessing cylinder health. And, and that should really be the driving force between be, behind our decisions in terms of whether we need to do anything about a cylinder, and if so, what we should do. I I, I did an EAA webinar a while back called Borescope Ascendancy, where I went into a lot of detail about what we look for with a borescope. I'm not going to go through that whole thing with you now, although you can you can look up that other webinar if you want to. But just show you a couple of quick pictures. Um, one of the things we always look at really carefully uh, with a bore scope is the exhaust valve. And what we would like to see is an exhaust valve that has a symmetrical appearance like this one. This exhaust valve is in a state of really excellent health um, and it, it, it appears very symmetrical and it, it basically has an appearance that looks like a bullseye. They, they aren't, don't always look quite that profound a bullseye. This one is pretty profound because it's got a fair amount of exhaust deposits on the face of the valve. This this was an engine that was probably operated rich a peak. Um, if, if it's a lean a peak operation, the, the valve tends to be a lot cleaner and the signature tends to be a lot more subtle. But the, the important part is that it's symmetrical, which means that the heat load on the valve is even all the way around and, and there isn't any place around the circumference of the valve where exhaust is, is leaking out during the uh, during the combustion event. So we're looking for symmetry. What we are tr hoping not to see is something like this, which is a highly asymmetrical valve, which is actually, this one is right on the, on the verge of failure and, and, and it has an extreme hot spot uh, right where the little yellow arrow is, and this particular valve probably wouldn't wouldn't have survived more than another ten hours 
before a piece of it broke off and shut the cylinder down. <coughs> and by the way, that used to happen quite a bit, that, that, that we would actually lose exhaust valves. It was called swallowing an exhaust valve. And, and in my, the early years of my aircraft ownership, that was something that happened pretty regularly. Now that we have bore scopes and we can look at this stuff um, and, and see it coming, um, 50 or 100 hours ahead of time, there's really no excuse for us to ever swallow an exhaust valve again. But um, the, the earlier we can detect these problems, the easier it is to, to remediate. Uh, the other thing we look at with exhaust valves is, is we, we, we try to take a look at them with the valve wide open and work the bore scope around we didn't used to be able to do this with the old bore scopes, but now, now the bore scopes are so good that, that we can get really good pictures and get a, a good look at the at the ceiling surfaces, the, the back side of the valve and the seat the, where the ceiling is actually done. And what we're looking for is is a a, a well defined, even, fairly shiny surface there. Um, free of excessive deposits and so on um, that shows that the valve and the seat are sealing well together. Uh, this valve looks very, very good in that regard. Here's one that looks not quite so good. And again, you can get a really good view of the sealing surface. I love these pictures because we didn't used to be able to get pictures like this, but not now with modern boroscopes, we can, we can get beautiful, beautiful, very detailed, very high resolution close-ups. And you can see that the, the ceiling surface on the valve is, is not shiny. It, it's, uh, and, and there's, there's, you know, deposit formation on it. And there's a lot of deposits on the ceiling surface of the seat. And you can just look at this valve and, and see that, you know, that, that this cylinder probably didn't have a really good compression reading because if that valve and that seat can't can't seal well, which which they can if they're in this condition, um, you know, the, you're going to have a fair amount of air leaking past the valve when you do the compression test. Now, by the way, this this engine would run perfectly fine. You you never notice the slightest bit of degradation in this cylinder. It would make full horsepower and everything. But, but the problem is that if it's not sealing well, then it will eventually start to deteriorate more and more until it gets to the, to the point where it has a profound hot spot like that other valve I showed you. And we don't want to let it get that far. So you can see that this valve in this seat, this, this, this problem could be fixed very, very quickly, all we need to do is put a little valve lapping compound on there and, and, and clean up those surfaces, get those deposits off, get, get nice shiny contact surface reestablished. It, and we, we don't have to pull the cylinder to solve a problem like this. If we catch it you know, early like this, where there isn't a lot of metal erosion or warping or anything like that. And that's what really what we want to do. We want to bore scope these cylinders fairly frequently so that we can catch these things early and, and do something about them and not have to pull cylinders. Um, while we're bore scoping, we also take a close look at the cylinder barrel. Um, here, here's an example of a cylinder. The, the bottom of it is the top of the piston and the top of it, you can see the, the, the cylinder walls. And you know this is a fairly high time cylinder. Um, uh, but but you can still see at least a little bit of the original cross hatch on it. Uh, we don't see really any vertical scoring on the cylinder wall that, that would indicate a ring problem. We don't see any corrosion pitting. Um, so you know it's a high time cylinder, but it, it looks in pretty good shape, and it's probably got a lot of useful life left. Um, here's a cylinder barrel that that has got problems. You can see very profound corrosion pitting. You can see vertical scoring on it. Um, th this cylinder barrel has uh, been let go. It's th most likely this engine was in, in a condition of disuse for a long time and 
the, the oil film stripped off and, and got this, this, uh, this rusting uh, going on. So this, this cylinder probably is going to have to go. Um, but, um, but you can see just, you know, what, what a, a wonderful tool the bore scope is for looking at the cylinder and, and determining its condition, determining exactly what's wrong, making um, good decisions as to uh, as to exactly what needs to be done. Does the cylinder need to be pulled or is there something we can do uh, to solve the problem without pulling a cylinder? We always like to avoid pulling a cylinder if we possibly can because it's it's expensive and it opens Pandora's box and all the stuff we were talking about before. So, you know, as I said, if, if air is leaking, and, and by the way, when you do a compression test, which unfortunately we have to do, the numbers that you get on the gauge are less important that, than where the air is leaking out. So when you do a compression test, you're not just supposed to look at the gauge and write the number down, you're supposed to use your ear and say, where's this air leaking? Is it, is it, do I hear it coming out the exhaust pipe? Is it, is it leaking past the exhaust valve? Do I, do I hear it coming out of the uh, out of the oil filler? Is it leaking past the rings? Um, theoretically, I suppose it could be leaking past the intake valve, and you'd hear it coming out the the induction air filter. Although it's very unusual for uh, low compression to be caused by by intake valve problems, but but you're supposed to listen and, and figure out where the air is leaking. So if if the compression is low because air is leaking past the rings, um, you know we know why that happens. It's mostly because the piston was cool and it was had a very sloppy fit, and we got unlucky about where the ring gaps came up. And so doing an engine run and then retesting that cylinder just as hot as we possibly can get it will almost always bring the, the reading up by at least 10 points. And sometimes, as I said, it can bring it up really dramatically. Um, if the air is leaking past the exhaust valve and the bore scope uh, reveals that the, the valve isn't too far gone, and we, we just looked at a couple of, you know, at a valve that, that wasn't too far gone. And earlier we looked at a valve that was really far gone and right on the verge of, of failing. Um, and if if it's too far gone, then then, then we're going to have to pull the cylinder and get it revalved, unfortunately. But if it's not too far gone, if we catch it in time, and the way we catch it in time is to bore scope regularly, then we typically can resolve the exhaust valve problem without removing the cylinder. And you know we've developed this technique for lapping valves in place. Mechanics have been actually doing this for for a long time. Um, and the traditional procedure for doing it is you don't remove the cylinder, but you drop the exhaust off and um, and then work through the exhaust port to to get the lapping compound in on, on the valve. But um, but I developed a a procedure that doesn't even require dropping the exhaust, where you were the only thing you have to remove are the top and bottom spark plugs, and so it's very fast and very easy. Um, and you, you basically put a bore scope through the top spark plug hole and you work through the bottom spark plug hole with these these um, applicators. I, I buy these things in packs of 100 from Amazon for 10 bucks or something and uh, use, a, use a, um, uh, a heat gun to uh, warm up the stem and bend it at an appropriate angle. And then I can use it to working through the bottom spark plug hole to uh, to apply uh, valve gravity grinding compound to to the uh, sealing surfaces of the exhaust valve, and, uh, the 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 valve uh, the rockers and, and uh, valve springs have been removed, and so I can twirl the valve and work the compound all around the valve, and I, I use a, a cordless electric drill coupled to the to the valve stem with a piece of tubing. This actually shows clear plastic tubing, but I found that the clear plastics tubing is a little too fragile. So now I use a, a little piece of automotive brake line um, to, to couple the, the drill to the, uh, to, to the valve. 
and and we we spin the valve with the drill um, and pull on it to to put pressure uh, between the valve and the seat with a grinding compound in there. And you spin it for a little while and you hear it go from a very gritty sound to a very smooth sound, and then you lather, rinse, repeat several times, and then you switch from coarse grinding compound to fine grinding compound, you do a little bit more, and then you clean everything off and put it all back together. We usually replace the rotor coil just um, because they're cheap and it's easy to replace it while everything's part like this. That's the rotator cap that rotates the valve. And, um, and, and then after 15 or 25 hours, we'll stick a borescope back in there and see if the valve seems to be healing itself up, which if you do this right, it, it and the valve wasn't too far gone, it almost always does. Uh, I made a video of how to do this uh, called Lapping Exhaust Valve in Place Without Dropping the Exhaust. It's it's on our YouTube channel. Here's a here's a short URL if you if you want to watch the video, um, especially for you A and P's out there. Um, bit.ly slash lapping hyphen in hyphen place, easy to remember. Um, but at any rate, it's 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 a neat procedure. We've now used it a lot. We've used it with tremendous success. And again, if you uh, if you bore scope the cylinder relatively often, you, you can catch these problems early enough that lapping will resolve them, and we don't have to pull a cylinder and send it out somewhere and have the valves and seat replaced and all of that stuff. And run the risk of having the cylinder condemned, or run the risk of looking in the engine and seeing something we don't want to see. We just don't like pulling cylinders. We don't have to. And this is a very, very non-invasive way to solve uh, exhaust valve problems if, if, if they aren't too, too far gone. So at any rate, just a couple of key takeaways and, and I'll open it up for, uh, for Q&A. Never, ever, ever approve cylinder removal based solely uh, on a compression test, the compression test results. The, the compression test has been responsible for, you know, condemning tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of cylinders over the year that didn't need to be removed because the test is so bad and so unreliable and, and such a poor measure of actual cylinder condition. It's, you know, it's, it's early 20th century technology. We have such, so much better ways of dealing with things now and particularly with really phenomenally good bore scopes available for 250 bucks. I mean, I encourage every aircraft owner to, to own his own bore scope and to, if, if, he, if he does his own spark plug stuff, stick a bore scope in there and look around. Um, I used to say never remove a cylinder based solely on compression unless it's zero over 80. I've stopped saying that because even if it's zero over 80, it, it turns out that that one of the reasons it could be zero over 80 is 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 because of particularly in a Lycoming engine because of a a sticking exhaust valve that doesn't close all the way. Well, we don't have to remove cylinders to to fix sticking exhaust valves. Um, Lycoming has a really nice service bulletin for how to do that, where you you basically drop the valve into the cylinder, remount the guide to re eliminate the sticking, and pull the exhaust valve back into place. And it doesn't doesn't require cylinder removal. So e even if the compression is zero over 80, we, we, we don't want to be pulling the cylinder. We want to be sticking a bore scope in and saying, you know, what's what's wrong here? And a, a lot of shops that, that now do use bore scopes will only bore scope cylinders if they have low compression. That's not a good idea. We should always bore scope every cylinder any time a top spark plug is removed, it takes no time. And if it give if if it gives us a chance to to catch an exhaust valve problem early, then 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 we can fix it by lapping, and we don't have to pull a cylinder. If we don't find out about it until it's too far gone, then um, th then it may be too late. We may have to may have to pull a cylinder and revalve it. So. We want to be bore scoping these cylinders as often as we possibly can. 
Um, so we always have to require a thorough bore scope inspection, which means bore scoping every cylinder at every annual and preferably any time you do spark plug rotation or any reason that the that the spark plug is removed. It 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 it, it almost seems to me like malpractice not to st stick a bore scope in the hole, you know, while, while it's vacant. Um, and always consider alternatives to cylinder removal. We have these minimally invasive remedies now. If it's an exhaust valve problem, we, we do lapping in place. If it's a, a, a ring problem, we have a ring wash procedure that, that, that may clear it up. Um, or if it doesn't clear it up, at least it will identify exactly what cylinders um, have the problem. Uh, so oh, always consider minimally invasive remedies as an alternative to cylinder removal. We, we really don't like to pull cylinders unless there's really no alternative. So much, so I'll get off my soapbox now, <laughs> Tim, and open it up for some Q&A. Thanks, Mike, great presentation. Um, starting off with uh, Red's question, why is, or what is the history behind using 80 for the standard testing? Why not test at 60 or at 100? I really have no idea, except that pr probably back when this test was invented, um, that that was all that was all that 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 the the air compressors were were able to put out. I don't know where eighty came from, um, but you know it's it's when when the cylinder is actually in operation, the 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 the, the peak combustion pressure in the cylinder is typically more like 800 PSI. If it's a turbocharged airplane, it could be 1,000 PSI. Um, so, you know, it's, it's funny because even, even if there's like a bunch of deposits on the, on the seat and on the, on the face of the valve that, that are allowing air to leak when we're doing a compression test, um, you know, when there's 800 or 1,000 PSI pressing against that valve trying to close it, uh, it, it you know the, those deposits typically don't make any difference, but they, but they make a difference when we're doing a compression test at 80 psi, which is an, you know just another one of these many artifacts of the test. The, the test is it's testing the cylinder under extremely unrealistic conditions that that have really very little bearing or very very little correlation to what the engine actually does when it's running. John wonders how is a compression test affected by density altitude? I don't know, but but the the any effect the density altitude would have on the test is is so much smaller than than all of these other noisy things that happen in the test. I mean, you you can be pretty sure that that 600 hour endurance test that Continental did was all done at pretty constant density altitude because the engine basically ran continuously until the 600 hours was up, and, and you know the compression just varied wildly by you know 20 points up and down. So if if density altitude could could affect the, the reading by by one or two psi, it it, it wouldn't make any difference. Joseph wonders, is compression testing required to be a leak down test or would testing similar to the way automobile testing is done be acceptable, i.e. IA, IA rotating the engine with the starter? Well, that's a really interesting question. Uh, the, the regulation says nothing about how you do the test. It doesn't say anything about 60 over 80. It doesn't say anything about differential compression. It just says if it has weak compression. That's all it says in the reg. The advisory circular makes it pretty clear that it's a differential compression test, but the advisory circular doesn't really apply to most of our engines. Um, both Continental and Lycoming specify using um, the the uh, using a differential test. But you know, you could argue as to whether it's whether doing it the way Continental and Lycoming says is the only acceptable way of doing it. You know, the Lycoming 
guidance is in the service bulletin and generally part 91 operators are not required to, to comply with service bulletins. Um, Continental moved, moved their, their guidance from a service bulletin to manual M0, presumably to give it a little bit more in the way of teeth. There certainly wouldn't be anything to stop you from, from doing an automotive type, shall we call it a dynamic compression test, in addition to the differential test. Uh, wh whether you can just not do the differential test at all, th that's kind of a borderline question. The, the, like I said, the reg doesn't say anything about how, how to test compression, um, but the advisory circular, Lycoming's service bulletin and Continental's M0 guidance, all are pretty clear that they want you to do a differential compression test. Randall says, I don't disagree with any of this, but it still seems the compression test has some value since it would detect problems with the rings, given that a bore scope can't really see those, your thoughts? Well, I, you know, I, I, I sort of disagree. I, I understand where you're coming from, but um, any, f first of all, the 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 leakage past the rings that that is detected by the compression test, it, it tends to be more artifact than it is real because of this problem about the, you know, the rings being very distended out, out, out of this piston that has got a real sloppy fit and all that stuff. Um, but the other thing is that any major problems with the rings, you know, like a broken ring or something, we see in the bore scope. That, that's why we look for vertical scoring. If we see vertical scoring on the cylinder walls, and it's not unusual to see a tiny bit of vertical scoring, but you know, just from like dirt or something that got in there. But if we see any significant vertical scoring, particularly if we see vertical scoring that that looks kind of fresh, that's a pretty good indication that that you know we have a broken ring or or or, or a problem like that. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I agree that that the borescope can't detect problems with the rings it can certainly detect severe problems with the ring and, and i'm also not sure i agree that 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 the compression test does a very good job of detecting the condition of the rings because of all these artifacts that we're talking about and and look i'm not saying don't do compression tests because you know we have to follow the regs so we're going to do the compression test I'm more talking about what we do with the results of the compression test as opposed to whether we whether we actually do the test or not. We, we need to take those numbers with a huge grain of salt. We need to use it maybe as as one little data point in, in, in our assessment of cylinder condition, but not the dominant data point the way most mechanics do. They, they did kind of treat Compression is kind of the be all or end all. And I said, not just mechanics. I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I, I, I can't see, tell you how many uh, aircraft buyers I've seen um, walk away from buying an airplane because of the compression test readings during the, that were done during a pre-buy, which to me is insane. I mean, first of all, why would you walk away from a perfectly good airplane just because it had, you know, a weak cylinder? But second of all, just because the compression is low doesn't mean there's anything wrong with this cylinder. Maybe it means, well, we need to look further, but um, it, it, we, I, did, I just think we put way, way too much weight on these, on these compression numbers that, that really turn out not to correlate very well with, with anything. Several people are asking if you could give a recommendation for a good, inexpensive, owner-purchased bore scope. Yeah, absolutely. The, the bore scope that, that I have been using for the last several years um, is a something called a Vividia, V-I-V-I-D-I-A, um, Able Scope Model 400L. Uh, 
I, I was at their booth at AirVenture, um, uh, and uh, I, it looked to me like the 400L has has now been superseded by something called the 450, which was only very slightly different. Um, but the 400 VA 400 or VA 400 or, or VA 450, um, uh, if you get the current model, they 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 changed the camera on it about a year ago to dramatically improve the the resolution, and so you you, you want to make sure you get one of the new crop of VA 400s, or if you get a VA 450, I'm sure those will all be the newest ones. Um, but the, the quality of the of the images got drastically improved. And for some reason, they decided not to change the model number when they improved the camera. So if you ordered it off of Amazon, you never knew whether you were going to get one of the old ones or one of the new ones. If you order it directly from the manufacturer, the manufacturer's a company called uh, Oasis Scientific, um, and uh, they make lots of borescopes, uh, real fancy ones. But th this VA 400L or VA 450 is a, a, a is a basic rigid borescope that just works very very well for for cylinder inspection. And the price, it, it it actually used to be $200. They raised the price to $250. I still think it's a screaming bargain. Um, it, it, it is a USB scope. It doesn't come with an imaging device. So you can you can plug it into, into a, a, a small laptop computer. You can plug it into a, an, an Android um, a tablet. Uh, I, I actually use a little wi-fi box that they also offer and i i can image it on my iphone or on my ipads and stuff um and it you know you can capture stills you can capture videos and if if you go look at that video of lapping in place that i did all of that stuff was taken with a, a va 400 l bore scope but it's it's an exceptionally good scope um for what I think is an awfully reasonable price. James wonders, my readings have always been very high for the past 10 years in the 75 over 80 range or higher. To what would you attribute this? Um, I would attribute it, well, you know, you, you're going to make me guess now because you're not going to tell me anything, but <laughs> I'll, I'll make a couple of guesses. First of all, I'm going to guess that you fly behind a Lycoming engine. And second of all, I'm going to guess that your compression tests are done with the engine hot. I think that's as far as I'll go with my guesswork. How'd mm. I do? <laughs> <laughs> all right. John says, it seems the concern is always about the exhaust valve. What about the intake valve? Uh, intake valves almost never give us any problems. I mean, if you think about it, uh, the intake valve runs nice and cool. Um, you know, it's it's it, it, the only time it's exposed to heat is is when it's closed, and when it's closed, it's it's heat sinked very well. So it, it, the intake valve never gets particularly hot. In fact, intake valves are not even made of the exotic kinds of high temperature uh, nickel rich alloys that uh, that exhaust valves are, are, are made out of. They're, they're made of much more pedestrian stainless steel because they just never get hot. They live an easy life. But I've always said, you know, if, 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 if I ever come back um, in reincarnation as an engine part, the, the one engine part I don't want to be is an exhaust valve. <laughs> Because those things, those, I mean, it, it is absolutely <laughs> astonishing that they last as long as they do. That they, they, they live a horribly, you know, they're, they're exposed to these ridiculously high temperatures. They, 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 they op, go in and out of their guides with essentially no lubrication because, you know, that you, you couldn't, you can't really get any oil in there because it, it would, it would immediately coke up. It's, it's just too hot. 
it, it's just that that's a horrible thing. Don't don't come back as an exhaust valve. <laughs> Give me. We a all have a new thought, Mike Bush incarnating <laughs> <laughs> in the afterlife as an engine part. Yes, please, Lord, <laughs> don't make me come back as an exhaust. <laughs> Hey, so speaking of that, Chris asks I'll, for I'd exhaust. like to be an accessory gear, something nice and calm, you know. Yeah, that that has a long life, right? Yeah, don't don't make me reciprocate. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. willing to turn. <laughs> Spinning is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris says uh, for exhaust valves on the verge of failure, non-symmetric, non-bullseye pattern. Is this due to the valve not rotating? Sometimes. It, it 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 sometimes it's due to the valve not rotating, so that the, the you know the part of the valve is in a hotter part of the combustion chamber, part of it's in a colder part. And one of the reasons for it rotating is to equalize that heat load all around the circumference of the valve. Um, but it also can be caused by by, by um, you know the valve either having um, metal erosion significantly or, or starting to warp significantly. Um, so we, we, we've seen exhaust, you know, seriously burned exhaust valves that were still rotating. And we've seen a lot of seriously burned exhaust valves that stopped rotating where the, the fact that they stopped rotating probably contributed to their burning. Several people have asked the question, um, once you do the lapping for, or the um, on your exhaust valve, the lapping procedure, so you got that lapping compound in there, how do you, how do you clean all that up in the end? Oh yeah, the, the, everybody always asks that. Um, uh, I, I, I rigged up a little homebrew nozzle made of a piece of plastic tubing that, that I, uh, melted the end closed and then poked a little hole in the side of it so that I could I could shoot solvent at a 90 degree angle and I insert it through the bottom spark plug hole. But that that's really not the most important thing I want to say about it. The most important thing I want to say about it is contrary to popular belief, it is not really important to clean that stuff out. Um, I mean, we, we'll clean it out as well as we can, but it's not important to to clean it out super thoroughly. Um, and again, that that that's a, a a misconception that that a lot of mechanics have that if you put lapping compound in there, you got to scrupulously clean everything, which you sort of can do if you drop the exhaust, but it's pretty hard to do if 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 you don't. The the point is that. The valve grinding compound is, um, it's basically grease with, with, with some silicon carbide particles suspended in it. And if there's valve grinding compound left uh, on, on that exhaust valve, the, the minute you start the engine, the, the grease instantly liquefies and, and, and the stuff just immediately gets blown out the exhaust. Um, it's not going to hang around the cylinder, and it's not going to it's not going to cause any any mischief. And there's no way that it can really move into the cylinder um, because the exhaust flow is going the other way. Uh, so, it, it I, you know my my view it's you, you don't really have to uh, be too OCD about trying to clean the stuff off. It 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 it'll it, it'll take care of itself once you start the engine. Uh, Mark just made a comment. He agrees with what you're saying. Uh, he used to be in medicine, and in medicine, it is malpractice not to do minimally invasive procedure. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, typically go talk to the Flying Physicians Association every year, and um, I, I love doing that. Um, and and I'm, I'm the only aviation speaker that sits through all, all of the 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 uh, the the, the the medical education lectures because I find this stuff fascinating. But uh, the the parallels, in my view, between medicine and aviation maintenance are very very striking. Um, but aviation maintenance is, you know, many decades behind medicine in in terms of um, 
all, all lots of things, but uh, um, you know, for, for example, in medicine, um, we we have subspecialties that that do that, that are our diagnosticians. We have radiologists, we have pathologists, and stuff. We we should have a diagnostician rating on on the mechanic certificate, but we don't have anything like that. And most A and P's are are pretty good surgeons, but they're often not the greatest diagnosticians and um, but but yeah the, the this whole notion of of, of using the, the the least invasive procedure possible is, is something that just has seemed to have been lost on the on the GA maintenance community that mechanics I mean they just love taking stuff apart and we try to get them not to take stuff apart if it's not absolutely necessary Stevens asks, are compression tests required for an experimental aircraft? Yes, right. We got to do our annual condition and inspection right in accordance with uh, part 43 appendix D. That's right in our operating limitation that's issued to all experimental aircraft. Well, thank you for answering that question for me, Tim, because I was hoping you would do that. <laughs> I don't claim yeah. to be an authority on experimental aircraft. Um, it is interesting. Experimentals have to follow that same checklist of items as the minimally acceptable, you know, for an annual. Yeah, the, you know, the one, the, the ones that I've that that I find most mysterious. Uh, I've talked about this before, or or SLSAs, hmm. because the the LSA rule, of, of, you know, Part Forty Three basically says. Um, this this part 43.1, which is the applicability, says this is applicable only to aircraft with standard airworthiness certificates. And then the SLSA rule, which is 91.327, I believe, um, mm -hmm. says that SLSAs must follow the applicable portions of part 43, but it doesn't say which ones are applicable. <laughs> it just leaves that as an exercise to the reader. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, but at any rate, it sounds it sounds like yes, you have to do a compression test, but no, you don't have to remove a cylinder if the compression is any particular number. You, it, it's it, the reg just says. I mean, part part four three appendix D just says weak compression without defining it any further. So that gives us a, a lot of um, wiggle room as to what we do with those numbers once we get them. But we do have to collect them. Yeah. John wonders, is engine performance affected with reduced compression numbers? It's not, and that's very interesting. Continental did a test uh, back, I'm sure it was 30 years ago, because um, I remember sitting down over dinner with the vice president of engineering of Continental, and he told me about this. Uh, but they 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 took one of their engines, I think it was an IO550, um, and they, they ran it up on the dynamometer at, in, at the, uh, at their engine, their engineering test cell in Mobile, and it was a it was a 300 horsepower engine, and it put out like 305 horsepower on the dynamometer. And then they went and they filed the ring gaps uh, on the compression rings to intentionally make the compression worse. And and they 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 brought it down to 60 over 80, and they ran it up on a dyno, and it. Put out 305 horsepower and they filed the ring back gap some more got it down to 50 over 80 and they ran it up on the dyno it was 305 horsepower and they brought it down to 40 over 80 it was still 305 horsepower now they didn't go any further because by the time it was down to 40 over 80 um the crankcase was so pressurized by blow by and the oil was getting blown out the breather so fast that they couldn't run the engine for very long but they never did get any decrease in horsepower. I heard another story, which I can't personally vouch for. I can vouch for the one I just told you. Um, and, and so the story I'm about to tell you, I think is true, but it could be apocryphal. And that was, th there was some University of, uh, of North Dakota aviation students who just for the hell of it put together a, a, a small four cylinder Lycoming and left the compression rings out altogether to see if the engine would run. 
and they got it to make like 80 percent horsepower with no compression rings and stuff mm -hmm. the, and again the the, the point is the, the at operating temperature the piston has a very snug fit in the cylinder and the compression rings don't have to do a lot at the temperatures we 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 do the compression test at the piston has a very sloppy fit in the cylinder and the compression rings have to make up a pretty large annulus so it's that that's why it's it's so, so much difference between what we see in a compression test and what actually happens when the engine is running Kartik wonders, um, thanks for the informational session, Mike. And uh, is it true that Continental engines generally have lower compression than Lycoming's? If so, why is that? Um, yes, and I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, yes, Continentals generally have, at least in my experience, tend to have lower compressions. Um, and Continental seems to recognize that in in terms of what their no-go threshold is. Uh, Daniel says um, he bought the uh, Vividia uh, VA400 bore scope and uh, his AMP and him used it on the Continental 0470 and his Cessna 182. Uh, AMP liked everything he saw, except that he felt one exhaust valve did not open as far as he thought it should. The mating surfaces look good. Is there a possibility that the cam lobe is worn? Yeah, there's a possibility. Um, um, it's also there's also a possibility that a less expensive possibility that that the lifter uh, might have leaked down. Um, if the lifter has has a higher leak down rate, then then by the time you did the compression test, it it may have leaked down and so it wasn't lifting the the exhaust valve as far as it should um if if you if you're really interested in that you you can take some measurements continental i don't believe publishes specs for how much valve lift the, the engine should have i don't know why they don't publish that but if you if you went around and and intentionally made sure all the lifters were completely leaked down and completely compressed. And then you measured the the valve lift, say with a dial indicator or something. This is all something you can do without taking very much apart. Um, see if if that particular one is an outlier and is lifting less than the others. But it it could be um, a cam lobe that that that's starting to get flat or it could be a lifter that that leak down the the lifter is i mean it's super easy to replace on an 0470 um you don't have to split the case or anything you just pull it out from the outside the cam of course would would be kind of bad news but i, I wouldn't I, you know i wouldn't be too concerned about this in the sense that a flat cam lobe is not something that is going to make you fall out of the sky and it it's going to um it, it in theory would cause a small amount of performance degradation but in my experience pilots almost never notice it because it's so small so you know if if you're not seeing ferrous metal in the filter um then then i you know i i certainly wouldn't start taking things apart just to find out if you had a flat cam low i mean you, you actually can with the with 0470, just pull the lifter out and stick a bore scope in, in the vacant lifter bore and get a look at the cam lobe. Um, you can even put a, a pick in there and, and rub it on the surface and see if there's you know anything that looks like a crack or anything like that. You can actually see quite a bit without pulling cylinders and so on. And Continentals can on Lycomings, but on Continentals you can. On Lycomings, if it's a six cylinder Lycoming, you can stick a a bore scope down the oil filler and get a pretty good look at a couple of the cam lobes. Um, if it's a four cylinder like homing, there's no good place to stick the bore scope. I kind of kind of wish they designed these engines with, with you know little plugs that you could take out and stick bore scopes in, but you know, when they designed these engines, they didn't have bore scopes, so they didn't that wasn't part of their the design. 
Well, Mike, we've got the end of our time period here. Uh, thank you so much for this awesome session. Looks like we had about 660 people uh, logged in tonight with us. Take a moment and share closing thoughts. Okay, well, my first closing thought is I hope that means we have 660 people who won't be spring-loaded to pull cylinders at the next annual. <laughs> um, anyway, if, if, if you guys are not already on my email list for, for the for, for a monthly newsletter and interesting maintenance stories that we sometimes send out to our mailing list, uh, and you'd like to get on the list, the easiest way is to text the word SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777. And the little bot will ask you for your name and uh, your email address and add you to the list. I think that only works in North America if you happen to be seeing this from Europe or South America or something, then the best way to do it is to go to the savvyaviation.com website and click on the button that says put me on the newsletter list. Um, my four books are available where, where, where fine aviation books are sold, uh, EAA a bookstore online, um, uh, the Aircraft Spruce sells them, uh, you, you can order them off Amazon. The first two books um, are available in audiobook form, and uh, now that I'm back from AirVenture, we're about to start working on the audiobook version of the, uh, of the two ownership books. Big project there, there were 500 pages a piece, so I'm determined to try to get those um, in audiobook form by the end of the year. I'm a, kind of an audiobook junkie. Um, I do a, 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 a podcast um, with my colleagues, um, Colleen Sterling and Paul New, and we just, uh, we just, uh, Today actually did our first recording session where we're, we're, we're switching from once a month to twice a month. Uh, the response to the show has been so great and the number of questions that have been coming in have, have given us such a backlog that uh, our producer, uh, Ian Twombly, decided that we it was time to, to make it a, a twice a month podcast. So I guess it'll be coming out on the 1st and 15th of the month going forward. We did a live version of the podcast at, at AirVenture and that's going to be put out and these things are, are are done both as a podcast and a video cast so you can watch them on YouTube uh, and see our smiling faces and or you can uh, just listen to them like a normal podcast but if you'd like to participate in, in the show if you have a question that you'd like us to to, to deal with um, just email it to Ian at uh, podcasts at aopa.org and he'll schedule you for one of the recording sessions and we'll we'll all have a lot of fun with your question. And finally, um, the next three of these uh, first Wednesday of the month webinars, I know, I know this is the second Wednesday of the month, but Tim cut me a little slack because the first Wednesday of the month was the day I got back from Air Ranger. Um, but the, the September uh, webinar is on legal interpretations. Um, if, if you have a question about what a regulation means or you think maybe a regulation has got a mistake in it or something, you, you could send a letter to the uh, the rulemaking lawyers at the FAA Office of Chief Counsel. And if you're lucky, you'll you'll get back a, a letter of interpretation, which basically is, is, a, is a, a binding interpretation of the reg. And so I talk about some interesting ones. Um, uh, legal interpretations, particularly ones that 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 indicate that the reg doesn't mean what we all used to think it meant. <laughs> There's some interesting uh, interpretation. October um, is entitled "A Fortunate Catch." Uh, I'm going to basically be talking about um, the importance of of, of maintenance aware aircraft owners as the last line of defense against maintenance induced failures and an interesting story about that that and some really good pictures that i have to share with you and in november um the the, uh, the webinar is entitled miracle in sioux falls um i don't want to i don't want to give away the punchline on this but i'll just tell you it has it had something to do 
with my flight to Air Venture this year. <laughs> and I also have some really good pictures. Um, so uh, those are the next uh, the next three webinars. And I think that's about all I, I have for tonight, Tim. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, Mike. Uh, absolutely fascinating, absolutely awesome information. Several people saying thank you and a great webinar. And uh, to everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. Good night, everybody. Thank you.